Welcome, my friends. This is Mike Williams. Will Peter Jackson's Get Back documentary rewrite and revise Beatle history? Film and video researcher Paul Jansen joins me to break down and analyze Peter's recent Get Back trailer to see if there are any clues embedded in the promo. And so without further ado, here's the interview with Paul. And thanks for listening. Hey, friends, we have a great show. As promised, Paul, who is a film and video researcher, it has joined me for this episode. And we're going to go through Peter Jackson's most recent trailer of his Get Back documentary, which is going to premiere later this month on November 25th, 26th, and 27th. Three days. And this is the film where we supposedly have 55, 56, or 57 hours of unseen footage. So Paul, being a video and film buff, is going to give his analysis. We're going to step through the trailer. And I have it at um, one-third speed, Paul, so we can take it nice and slow. Yes. And what we're going to do, and mostly Paul, we're going to comment on what's taking place or what Paul believes is taking place so he can share his insights as to what Peter is doing with the film. So did you want to add anything, Paul? Uh, ju no, just that I'm, I'm Dutch. Uh, English is not my native speech, but I, I hope I can manage. And if some errors may occur, then please forgive me. It's not my... <laughs> ah, you'll do fine. <laughs> it's, it's not my daily language. So anything, anyway, okay. All right, so we're going to get started. So the first screen we first have scene. up, Paul, yeah. So explain to us about the text. You, you talked about this with me about a week ago or so. What, what is yeah. Peter doing with the way the font is being presented? It's, it's, a, it's a font typically of newspaper or also uh, as it is uh, being used in um, uh, Hollywood uh, scripts, movie scripts. But it's a typical font that sort of announces us this is a documentary. If they would have used a different uh, happy font, then it doesn't work. They use this typically font. And also by using text cards, they sort of indicate to us, this is a documentary and we're using text cards and not a voiceover. So the mindset for the viewers is, is sort of preset with knowing that what now follows is the truth because we're watching a documentary. And now the first shot is, the deconstruction of the scene in the Twickenham studios. So we see the, um, the studio in its entirety, uh, the four lads with their instruments. We see um, boom microphones, we see speakers, we see some other stuff in the background. We see some guy uh, walking uh, through the frame. So the set is uh, pretty much as we would expect for an opening scene for a documentary. Let me ask you, Paul, we know that the original film was shot in 16 millimeters. So this type of shot, the clarity, um, the colors are just popping out. Is this possible with the original 16 millimeter film? I think so, yes. They would have known what to shoot. I, I, I think not everything is uh, sort of uh, off the cuff. They, especially the, these background colors, it's a projecting screen and they they sort of project, I think with a rear projection, they, they, they project colored um, um, lights uh, to it. And the effect is that the foreground can be lit with uh, separate lights. So the guys are not green or yellow or uh, red. It's just a background, but it's this, this is a created shot. This is a created shot. So you don't think that this was part of the original footage? Uh, yes, well, no, it, it could be a part of the original footage, but this is as, as a shot, it is, it is constructed. Someone thought of uh, using um, a purple, green and red uh, colors in the background. Oh, you're saying and, the way they set it up? Yeah, the way they set it up. Okay, and gotcha. I, like you say about the clarity of the shot, that indeed can uh, can be done with a 60 millimeter film. Okay, so I'm going to uh, hit the play button. And like I said, folks, this is going at one third speed so that we don't miss yeah. anything. So, see guys busy walking around in the, in, the, in the shot. It's sort of indicating the documentary style. Everybody's moving. Cameras zooming in, or better yet, the camera is um, is roll, dollying, in, dollying in. Okay, so we have that dolly effect, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and then it says this resulted in over fifty-seven hours of the most 
intimate footage ever shot of the band. And as I mentioned in a video I did recently, Paul, that number is 55, 56, 57, depending upon uh, the, uh, the promo or the press release that's being put out. But now we have 57 hours. And of course, I mentioned this in my previous video, folks. 5 plus 7 is 12. 1 plus 2 equals 3. And this goes back to Billy's McCartney 3 album. But in any case, so we have the same font. Yes. Right. And I'll move forward. And now we open with uh, the first shot of John playing Don't Let Me Down. Very emotionally singing. But look, he's wearing a green shirt. And now we cut to him wearing a blue and yellow striped shirt. Uh, let me go back but, for a second. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So here, yes, he has a, a green shirt. A green shirt. You can see off his right shoulder would be on your left watching. And then as we go forward, they cut to a different scene from a different session. Right. Now, some of the audience might be thinking, okay, so why is that a problem? They just used clips from different days. So how, how would you answer that well, question? I, yes. I think this is, um, uh, we see this throughout the whole promo. Uh, there are some um, examples uh, later on. They also, what they also do is they, use a continuous uh, sound, in this case, the, the song, Don't Let Me Down, but they added uh, different images to it. And they uh, sort of gave the suggestion that it's all in one session, but we can clearly see that it's not. So you could argue, why is that? Why, why, do, they, why do they use different scenes from different uh, days of uh, filming? Um, it, it sort of indicates to me, at least, um, that not, not everything what we see is like it happened or maybe to push it further um, they added it in a way uh, that gives a narrative that maybe didn't happen okay so what you're saying is it's not contiguous so they actually copy and pasted to use layman's terms to actually piece together a storyline yes. or visual at least for this trailer now at least I'm, for this trailer right we, right we cannot say uh, how the, the the end result will look, but for this trailer, they they sort of cut it in this way. And if people watch the trailer at normal speed with sound, they sort of um, see that that that's a little movie in itself. They they preset the text with uh, three weeks of of the, the guys recording in the studio to record an album and to prepare for a live show, and halfway through we get. Uh, all the disturbances of George and uh, of some other things. So they they have to edit it to to tell a story within the promo. And by by using different images, maybe they could uh, get that story for the promo uh, to to work to function. Maybe later on in the final documentary, they use complete different editing. That's possible. But at least for the promo, this is my observation. They they. Um, they manip manipulate images to create a storyline. Okay, and when you talked about disturbances, were, were you referring to when George walked out of the sessions between January 10th and January 15th? Exactly, okay. exactly. And li like you probably will um, uh, illustrate later on how many days he left and when he left and when he returned. It's sort of, it's in between um, sessions or maybe um, at least it created a, a very difficult time for the guys. Right. Okay. It definitely would have impacted the schedule, right? And we'll get to the calendar in a moment. Yes. Because it pops up in the uh, in the trailer. So let's move on yep. here, and just let me know when you want me to stop. This shot of Billy. Um, this is some, some something to illustrate what you uh, said in your earlier analysis of the. Um, this the the way the microphones are used in the studio and what we see here is two di different types of microphones uh, one on the on the, uh, the horizontal uh, stand and the one on the on the lower stand which is a typical classical type of microphone I'm not sure about wh which type and what you said um is that these microphones pick up if they are sensitive they pick up any sound in the uh, in the in the surrounding so when we see the guy in the, in the rear, that's probably Michael uh, Lindsay Hawk, uh, who's 
famous in at least in this promo for uh, smoking a cigar you could argue why what why is he in the studio during a recording his sound of maybe lit lighting up a cigar or walking about is, uh, is picked up on in the microphones so in the recordings uh, they get disturbed with uh, with noise with uh, unwanted sounds right because what i had said was if this is rehearsal it's fine that's fine for a rehearsal okay. for rehearsal right but if they're trying yeah. to depict a scene or a scenario where they're actually laying down recorded tracks this does not work because exactly. these microphones will pick up everything the other thing i want to to point out michael lindsey hogg you could see the cigar right here right above billy's head but look at his hand it's in his pocket the hidden hand of freemasonry okay so we'll move on we've got this scene here yeah this is interesting of for a couple of reasons uh this is the first scene where we see um ringo playing behind these sound barriers for his drum sound not to be uh predominant in the in the in the recordings of the guys um but later on in some other shots we clearly see that he's not playing behind sound barriers so there's a discrepancy between the use of sound barriers for drums which we all know are very uh yeah uh, dominant in the sound yeah and if we look at this this image as well we have a microphone here to the upper right we have yes. a microphone here in front of john billy of course has a microphone which we can't see george's microphone is right here we have a microphone here and both uh george and john are playing electric guitars which means they're playing through amplifiers and even though ringo is behind the baffling here uh the problem is is that his symbol is actually right even with or maybe a little above it so anytime he hits that symbol it's going to crash right through yeah and all these microphones are going to pick up exactly the symbol crash and the truth of the matter is because he's so close to where they are anyway it doesn't matter that this divider or baffling is here it's no. just going to ring through so the point again being that for rehearsal purposes not a problem but if we're to believe or we're trying to be told to believe that this is some kind of recording session that's not the case and the other thing paul you and i called out when we, we spoke last week is look at the the piano and all the the coats the and the mess yeah and now it's it's only coats and you could argue coats won't affect the sound of a piano but later on we will see that the guys are having lunch at the piano and um what we know about Blutner, Blutner is one of the major piano um, manufacturing companies. Um, if I'm correct, this would equate to a nowadays instrument of more than $100,000. So to put your clothes or lunch or drinks on top of the top lid of the piano um, would, wouldn't make sense to say the least and would be very <laughs> unwanted. Okay. Let me move on here. Okay, so we have this eight track reel here. Yeah. What we said, uh, what I talked to you about uh, earlier is that we don't know if these are true shots. They, these could, uh, could have been made uh, last week. We don't know. But they, are, they use them as an insert to link one scene to a next scene so if there's not a natural uh, transition between two scenes you can use an insert to move that to make that transition happen to to make the audience uh, sort of give, give her a point of rest for your attention to to easily uh, move into the next scene that's use of their uh, inserts and the other thing i've noticed paul is when i watched the uh, the original film going back to 1970 these types of shots where it's zooming in close-ups and sweeps and all of that you don't see that in the original film mm. so to me this is something that obviously that peter has created for effect yeah like like we said we 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 cannot say for sure but at least in the promo it works it works for the, the effect of uh connecting two scenes together but okay. since this is uh, this is a shot that has no reference to any time frame um, 
they, they could have been made uh, last week or last month or last year when they when they edited uh, the, the whole promo. So they they and further in the, um, the promo we see some other scenes uh, with uh, Billy Preston, which are typically used to 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 move the story forward. Okay. Yeah. I'll click forward. Yeah. Then let's see. Okay, in the sound um, of this shot, um, we see this is uh, Ringo playing in the Twickenham studio. And the shot previous to this was in the Apple studio. But the sound soundtrack, again, is still playing Don't Let Me Down. So they they now we can for sure say that they used sever, several scenes to create one, uh, so, oh, sorry, several shots to create one scene. And again, this is, yeah, what what he um, very strong, uh, powerfully uses to to create the story. One of the things I wanted to point out, Paul, is in the first trailer, they play "Get Back," and of course, the uh, what's being implied is that that is the recording or one of the lost recordings or enhanced recordings that. Peter Jackson has brought back to life based upon the unseen footage. But the thing is, when I uploaded that to YouTube, YouTube identified the song as Get Back from the Beatles' Let It Be Naked album, which was the Let It Be album that Billy redid going back a number of years ago because he didn't like mm -hmm. the whole Phil Spector production. So the point I'm trying to make, folks, is that the first trailer was, I think, a little misleading because, you know, we're thinking, oh, okay, well, this is a a new version of the song. It's been remixed, remastered, or whatever, and uh, only to find out, at least I found out, that no, that version of Get Back has existed for several years, going back to when Let It Be Naked was released. So, you know, what I'm saying is these songs that we're hearing in the trailer, and I will put the link down below so you can listen to the whole thing. We, we don't want to have the sound here because otherwise it would interfere with what we're trying to say. Um, right. Is that, I don't know, it, it's not new stuff, is what I'm saying. It's, it, yes. it certainly appears like it's been released before and uh, it's not new and unheard. Okay, well, we'll I guess we'll move forward here. Yes. Okay, so then we have this part of the video which says the footage has been locked in a vault for over half a century unseen. And then you want me to move forward and John does yeah. a little something, right? Yes, John makes a, a gesture. We're, we're at one third speed, folks, so. Okay, so that's, he's kind of, his hand is going forward. He's emphasizing a, a thing, a moment, uh, something special, and then we see the text card until now. Okay. This is very, this is very powerful editing. Um, Peter Jackson uh, connects John's moving to this text until now, so it, it sort of anchors in our brain um, a visual and a text, and that's very uh, interesting how that how that works. Want me to move forward? Yes, please. Okay. This is still in the Twickenham studio. What I what I noticed here is that in all the Twickenham sessions, we see Ringo playing without um, the sound uh, baffling. Um, and also what I thought strange is why is he on a platform? Why isn't he on, on the same level as the, uh, the other guys? But please stop here, this is interesting. But it does make sense to have a, a typed out lyrics and a handwritten lit, written lyric from two different songs on one sheet. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so, so I don't know you... whether Peter's putting, you know, the two together for some kind of an yes. effect or, but yeah. what I pointed out was the the type text was, it's, very, it's not very clear, it's a bit blurry. Yes. Whereas the handwritten text is- Sharp, sharp. All, over the, all over the board, yes. And the other thing too, folks, is that Get Back was written by Billy and if he's supposed to be Paul McCartney, he's left-handed. And what we see here is handwriting that is written by somebody who is right-handed. 
I think so too, yes. Yeah, because if it was a left-handed person writing this, then you would have the left-handed slant yeah. on the letters, and we don't see that. What we have is yeah. right-handed. And the other thing, Paul, I wanted to ask you about is, again, if I go back to the 1970 film, there were never close-ups like this. And so this seems to me to be another piece of footage that was created and yeah. inserted into the trailer in order to yeah. create some kind of an effect. Like um, like in the shot of the um, the recording reels, uh, the tape recorder, we, we cannot, um, we, have, we don't have any other reference from this, um, what we see here, than only the, the typed text and the written text. So this could be a shot indeed, like you say, that Peter Jackson has uh, inserted recently, just to, to create a narrative. We cannot visually uh, connect it to any other thing. If there's maybe in a shot that follows up, we see written text that is picked up by a hand and the sheet of paper is uh, lifted off. But here we see just a, a, um, a standalone shot of a piece of paper with written and, uh, and, and typed uh, text. So it, it could indeed be a, a made after a, a fact. The official story tells us that the songs were works in progress which means that yeah. they came into the studio without complete songs and so it would seem weird that billy finishes the long and winding road and then he hands it off to somebody and says hey go type this up <laughs> yeah i mean i guess it could have been done right but sure but it, it you you the, the argument against it would be that that takes time you have to uh you have to wait for the type text to to get back to the to the studios to hand out to the guys to play the song. Right. While as you, if you would, uh, say to the guys, well, this is this is the lyrics. Uh, we're going to play it uh, from uh, my handwritten uh, lyrics. It saves time, and you could, uh, I don't know. It's it doesn't. It it seems strange to have it typed out. Okay, so let's take a look here. Then we get a shot, I think of. Uh, yeah, this this is interesting. You pointed out earlier in your uh, first analysis that the, um, this image uh, seems strange because John is looking sort of with a slant eye. And um, yeah, what his I noticed, right eye is kind of drifting. Yeah, sort of a drifting eye. Um, the other thing that you noticed is that the microphone is in focus and John and Billy are out of focus. Uh, technically, that would be uh, indeed like it is because the camera has focused on the mic and not on, uh, on John. It, it could, what you said uh, in your earlier analysis that the microphone could have been a added on um, effect in a different in a different image layer that can easily um, uh, added this into this uh, this shot. But what's interesting is that when we play it, that John is giving uh, what I think to Billy uh, the side eye, sort of a disapproving side eye. Um, as we move forward, yeah. So just before we leave this particular shot here, folks, what I had mentioned, as Paul just stated, is that we, we don't really have super clarity here with John. Right? We see his eye is drifting to the right here. and But look at the microphone. I mean, it's, it's very, very clear. You know, so, and, yeah, it's, it's it, I don't know. It just seems to me like this was inserted into the... Uh, into, into the, the footage, frame. yeah, 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 with a different layer and image. In in uh, in post editing, they can easily put that in in a different image layer, and uh, it it it, do, it does it doesn't affect the, the the total appearance of the scene. But we we as a viewer know, okay, the guys are singing, so we see what's happening. Yeah, and and again, Paul, just so that uh, I talk about this Michael, eye a little yeah. bit. I I had suggested that this was some kind of glitch with the technology um, as it was trying to rebuild or recreate facial features and stuff like that, that the artificial intelligence or, you know, whatever technology Peter's using, you know, it didn't quite catch it. Now, somebody wrote me and said that, hey, you know, uh, if somebody is a heroin addict, that one of the symptoms of, of having that addiction is that you could have a lazy eye. Now, the question I would have with that is that when I watched the original Let It Be film and seeing these trailers, 
I'm not seeing a John Lennon who appears to be a heroin addict. He seems to be very active, very playful, you know. So I don't know. Um, again, I take the whole story about Lennon being addicted to heroin, him and Yoko. Um, I'm not sold on that. I'm really not. No. Um, and the reason why is because, as I've mentioned in a previous video, I know somebody who is addicted to heroin. And the only thing that that person thinks about is their next fix. Yeah. All they're looking for is heroin. And, you know, I don't know. It, it just doesn't seem to fit with me based upon my own personal experience of knowing somebody who is an addict and then watching John in both the original film and in these trailers. So I guess I'll move forward. And you said that going forward, Billy kind of gives John a, a side eye. Now, John gives Billy the side eye here. Yeah, it's we very, can see John's eyes shift over to him. Yeah, so it's a very powerful, um, how do you say it, confrontation between the two. It's not not even a spoken dialogue, but the, the eyes uh, says, <laughs> says it all. It, it is, is kind uh, of an interesting very, look. <laughs> yeah, 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 very much. Okay, so let's move on here. Now, this this amazes me how clear this is right here. Yeah. Well, what we see in the background is this purple color, referencing back to the uh, the opening scene where we saw these uh, three colors: uh, purple, yeah, uh, red, and and green. So this is in the Twickenham studio, and the, the lighting in the Twickenham studios is different. the The lights are more um, from a lower angle, uh, directly to the faces of the of the guys, whereas in the Apple studios, the lights have been um, pointed to the ceiling and we get reflected and um, indirect light. So the indirect light is more softer. And here we have the direct light and it's more harsh. So we have a clearer image of the faces, but also it's, uh, it gives a harder shadows. But as a result, it indeed, it looks more clear. That's, um, that's a fact. And then we get the text card of the three weeks recording time you will see by the way the um the boom uh, microphone that's only being used for the recording of the cameras the film cameras um have a, a, a separate audio recording and they um they have to use a, a boom microphone because they don't get a feed from the the mixing desk they have their own standalone recording for the for the film cameras Okay. And here we now we see the uh, the text card for the uh, let's say the main premise of the whole story, at least for the for the promo, but I guess also for the the whole uh, series of three episodes. This three weeks uh, recording and writing time. Yeah. So it's another one of these crazy time frames in which the Beatles are going to pull off a miracle. So they have less than three weeks. They actually have about two and a half weeks. Exactly. To write and record a new album. At least at Rubber Soul, they said 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> and here they're saying less than three weeks. So yep. the, the 30 days that uh, I believe was uh, 30 work days, if I'm correct. If I With Rubber I'm Soul, not... no, it was October 11th to November 11th. So it, was, okay. it, it included okay. weekends. Okay, including weekends. So okay. here are two, three weeks is including weekends. But yes. as we see later on, uh, later on, we see a shot of the uh, of the calendar, and we see the exact um, timeline um, appear. Now we got some. Um, okay, so we have this scene here. This is again Twickenham Studio, and what you see now is that the lighting is completely changed. They have just uh, um, switched off the background colors, or. Maybe this is a different setting. I'm not sure, but at least it's it, uh, it's still um, Ringo on the uh, on the platform, and the guys uh, sitting around, and uh, Yoko is uh, reading a shopping list or something. <laughs> now we see George writing, and in the next shot following this, we, so we cut to a sheet of paper with lyrics. Um, here, we see the lyrics of um, "I've got a feeling," and this is being picked up by a hand and lifted out of the frame. Right. So, so the person watching this 
trailer would think that it was George. It was George who wrote I've Got a Feeling. I've but we know feeling. at least at least as far as the credits go that it's a, a, a song by uh, John and, uh, and Paul or okay. Billy. Okay, this shot here. Um, it could have been a real shot. But also, and like you said before, these shots were not included in the original documentary. So what we, in imagery, what we see here is, hey, uh, coffee has been served. Okay, guys, let's have a break. And in the shot, Billy Preston is um, just relaxing on the piano. And I'm not sure if this is a real shot. They could have easily mixed two layers into one shot. And if the shot of Billy Preston is, is a real shot, which we must assume since he is periodically um, correct in his dress and in his appearance, the shot of the four coffee cups in front of the, um, the Thunder Roads is it's maybe an afterwards made shot. We, uh, we cannot know, but it could be. Yeah, it's another one of these shots that you don't see in the original film. And, and the reason why I bring that up, folks, is that why would the filming technique be different, right? So if these are outtakes, if this is footage that was shot during the original film back in 1969, then... Why were these types of shots not incorporated in the original film? That that that's my question. You know, what why were they only in the in the footage that was cut or the outtakes? I, I don't know. To me it just seems very very strange. But here it adds uh let's say in for for as an image it adds to the overall atmosphere of the guys having a good time recording. Being relaxed. There time, relaxed, there's time enough to have a coffee, to hang on the piano, just to take it easy. Well, in, the, in uh, the back of our minds, we know that they are stressed out because they only have three weeks for a completely a new set of songs and a recording. So the, the, the imagery um, sort of makes an effort to show us, the viewer, the relaxed atmosphere. Right, so it's a scene that really conflicts with the official story uh, yeah. until Peter started showing us his version of the story or Billy's version of the story, right? Uh, we know that the Let It Be sessions were very tense. They were stressful. Yeah. And uh, the lads weren't getting along too well. Yeah. And like I you did. said, Paul, this scene is showing us, oh, it wasn't so bad. Cups of coffee, okay. Billy's just hanging out. You know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right, let's move forward here. We move forward. Um, we get a scene where George is, okay, this is the Mel hand, handing over a guitar to uh, Billy. Um, if I may comment on this type of shots, the promo of, um, let's say, the preview of uh, Peter Jackson also shows. Uh, typical shots where in the foreground we see either Billy or uh, John or whoever playing or doing something with uh, with their instruments and in the background we see two other uh, guys of the band still playing singing in the microphone and here as well we see George and John um, playing while Billy is handed his guitar by Mal. Um, it's a typical how do you say it a this this could have been done, like I said, in the other shots, uh, by adding an, uh, a different image layer. And it sort of emphasizes the, the group um, uh, atmosphere. So everybody is relaxed, uh, making music. Uh, Billy is um, uh, discussing something with Mel about the guitar. George and John are playing. It, this this group feeling, this atmosphere of the, the group being a tight group, is emphasized by these types of shots. Now move forward. Yeah, if we move forward, but now we get the famous um, shot of George asking, "How many songs have we recorded already? Good enough." Okay, but yeah. So maybe I should turn the volume up for that. But here is a uh, another insert. 
Yeah. So here again, uh, we don't know whether this tape recorder is, uh, what, my guess is that it's a tape recorder used by the camera crew. So the film camera have their own recorder for the sound. And what you see here is typically a, a smaller tape size. Uh, um, what you said earlier, the A-track size uh, tape are these very wide yep. uh, gauge um, uh, tapes, but this is a smaller gauge uh, tape. Um, I think it's only for recording the sound of one microphone of the um, the microphone, the boom microphone for the, uh, the film cameras. Okay. All right. And so we're coming up on the, uh, the question that George asks. Yeah. All right. Let me, let me just increase the volume a little bit so that folks can hear it. What we hear, we hear George asking how many have we already recorded good enough, but we don't actually see George uh, speaking these words. And then later in the next shot, we see John answering to Billy, none. So the dialogue is how many have we recorded? And John answers none. Right. But the way it is, the way the, the camera records it and how the, the guys are um, um, facing each other do, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And the other thing too, Paul, is uh, it also creates a problem for the narrative, right? less than three weeks for 14 songs. Yes. And then George is asking the question, how many are in the hopper? How many are done? And John says, none. None, yeah. So okay. so here, this is, let's say, a, cl a classical plot point in, in a normal movie um, script where the drama gets, um, gets the, how do you say it? It moves, it moves forward uh, 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 surrounding a, a plot point. How many have we already recorded good enough? No. So how many have we recorded good enough? And John Lennon says, none. none. So let me go back, folks. Play it again. How many have we already recorded good enough? None. George, in my view, is standing next to Billy wearing his fur coat. So first he has a jacket on, a jeans jacket. And in the next shot, he wears his fur, fur coat. And John is not answering uh, George. He's answering Billy. So the eye lines don't match up. So the, the imagery and the, and, the, and the sound don't match up. And here again, I think it's very powerful editing of something that possibly didn't happen. All right, so let me play this again. How many have we already recorded good enough? No. Oh, yeah. So they will film a concert of the new songs for a TV show and a documentary. And none of us has had the idea of what the okay, show is going to be. Interesting. Um, you want me to go back? Yeah, if you if you can, it, it, I, I wanted to explain something. Okay, we, what we see here in uh, the clapperboard is what you already explained. There is this classical two and a one numerology, what you um, most often uh, have explained what the meaning of that is. But we see it on the clapperboard, and the clapperboard in this shot disappears by what is called a jump cut. So it seems like a um, a continuing shot, but the jump cut is made in between. So they 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 cut out the the, the moment the clapperboard is being removed. And what we see is a clapperboard, and the next moment we see no clapperboard. We don't see it being taken away from the shot. In my view, but that's my view, um, it is a kind of a hint, a clue to people in the know. Uh, look, we have edited it. This whole sequence, this whole promo, the whole movie is clever editing. And this is an example and an openly and um, in, in showing in plain sight, openly telling us, at least people who are able to see it, this is clever editing. So if okay. you play it, Mike. Yeah, let me just uh, let me just reduce the playback again. So sure. there you go. Yeah, there you go. It's a, it's a, it's a normally um, considered a editing mistake if you make these types of edits in your final result. But here it is clearly being shown. So you could argue, or you could ask yourself the question, why is that? Why do they show it like they do? And then, but also they roll away the Beatles uh, drum head. I don't know if there is a meaning behind it, but I sort of, well. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. you just I'll go yeah. back. Yeah. I don't know if there's any meaning behind it, but the rolling away of the Beatles. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a weird type of cut. It's it's yeah. Now it's, it's there and then it's not, right? And then it's not. So you you it's normally considered a jump cut and it's an, an added error. It's not something you would want to have in your final film. Okay. Unless you want it in your film. So, okay. Anyway, uh, we see here the location scouting on top of the of the building, and what we see Billy is making this arm gesture of being uh, something huge and on the soundtrack but you don't have to show it it's it's quite obvious the soundtrack um, uh, says billy in voiceover none of us had the idea of what the show is going to be and then we see billy making this gesture so the show is going to be big that's also nice editing okay all right so then we have this scene here yeah, um, Michael N.C. Hawk, who has what I read about the planning of the rooftop concert was what I read, it was his idea to have it on top of the Apple building. If that's true, this, sense may, this scene makes sense. He's showing Billy um, some plans. And if we play it out, we, uh, we, we clearly see here in this shot. Right here. What I think is a section view of a building, a hallway or a doorway where, where a, um, a man figure, a person is standing inside this hallway or this building. Sort of, as, um, you can sort of get a, a sense of size of a plan uh, showing Billy how, what I think, the concert is going to, um, how it's going to take place, where it's going to be held, how it, it will look, uh, what has to be done in preparation, stuff like that and you, having this little uh, diagram in the right side uh, in the bottom right side of this plan we see it in the the yeah what i say i think a, a section view of a building with a person standing in it the other thing that's interesting about this piece of the footage paul is that it's clearly showing billy in charge because his male he is yeah. michael yeah. right and exactly. they're they're covering the plans. They're discussing the plans with him. Yeah. And what does he do? He stays seated at his piano. And what I thought of this scene is it clearly shows the indeed, like you say, the power of Billy. He's the man. He's going to he's making remarks of the of the building plans for the the concert. The two guys are standing up, are are standing, and Billy is staying seated. So the power uh, position between the three is very clearly shown here. Right. Normally, if, if someone shows you plans and they ask your opinion, you would also stand up to show them respect, um, getting to the same level of face-to-face. Um, -face. That's uh, the typical, uh, how do you say it, um, uh, interpersonal uh, behavior. Right. But in this case, what you're saying is it's a, there's a hierarchy in place. Exactly. Yeah, Billy is the man. Billy stays seated. I'm not going uh, to be bothered to <laughs> to stand up to to your to your level. I'm just uh, staying right where I am. I'm the man. Okay, want me to move forward? Yes, please. Don't saying something. I'm not sure quite what. Oh, this, the the mood is getting a bit lower. <laughs> Ringo leaning over, he thinks it's all right for me. Okay, this shot. This this is the side door of the recording room of the Apple uh, Studio. Uh, later on, we will see um, George, no John, uh, fooling um, about in front of this door. The lighting inside. Uh, we know this is the basement of the Apple Building, so they're walking up the stairs. But the lighting inside the stairwell is enough for us to see um, clearly Billy. And he's, he's looking over his shoulder as George is closing the door. And like you said before, George is very, I'm not sure. It seems that George is not in focus. Yeah. And if George is not in focus. Billy would be even more out of focus. Only the door seems in focus. So this is a very uh, much, um, 
um, reworked uh, shot to get uh, sharpness and clarity. That's a good point because the doors are in very good focus. Yeah. They're clear. Yep. And George is kind of out of focus. And if George is already, then Billy must be completely out of focus. Yeah. We saw Billy just uh, over, looking uh, over his shoulder. And then they tell us they haven't played live for an audience in three years. So, of course, this goes back to 1966 and this is 1969. Exactly. So this is also some kind of a setup for the, the, the drama that already has been announced in the previous text card for this recording time frame. So this emphasizes the drama. Yeah, this is what we discussed uh, previous, but I'm not sure if it's of any meaning. But what this this was a very uh, short. The flash. A sort of a flash frame. Uh, it only takes um, less than half a second. Right. And, and now remember, it, folks, this is at one third speed. So this goes by very fast if it's at normal speed. Yeah. And we don't we know it's John, but we don't clearly see it. So we could argue why. Why is it in the promo? What, what purpose does this, uh, this shot uh, serve? Well, in my view, it's just to disturb the audience. And disturbance is a way of um, is, an, is an, uh, a tool of storytelling. And then we've got somebody standing back here, and I, I honestly cannot make out who that is. Uh, some of the, the studio crew, uh, the, yeah. the film crew. Yeah. Yes. But this is something that we later on uh, can see in several other shots as well, that there's always people standing in the background in the shot. So, um, but that's maybe it's something that doesn't have any further meaning, but it's, it stands out. Now we see um, a little montage. This leads up to the, this is the, the section, what I call the cauliflower section. George is asking everybody uh, about his lyrics, what he, where he doesn't seem to find the, the right words. And um, John is uh, jokingly saying, well, just use the word cauliflower for any, any version of the words you don't uh, seem to find. This is this, this bit. I say what we see also here, um, again, the, um, the sound barrier. Um, next to the sound barrier, we see in this shot is the, the last speaker of the, uh, the Hammond uh, organ. And in some later shots, I have a nice, uh, interesting uh, comment on that as well. Okay. It's, it's not clear in this shot, but we come to uh, come back to that later. Okay, well, here's we see the piano he again too, Paul, right? Yeah, <laughs> already we see here some stuff on the piano what you could ask yourself, would you would you like to see uh, wine glasses on top of a $100,000 instrument? I'm not sure if I if it, if it were my uh, my piano, I wouldn't be so uh, happy about it. But anyway, maybe these these are the missing reels of the unseen. These are orders. the missing reels. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, I'll move forward. And now we get a shot of the uh, of the calendar. Okay, first this is yes, this. the The calendar obviously is a afterwards um, made shot. This is not an actual calendar from those days. It has printed text font live shows. Next, later on, we see printed type of George meeting and we see printed type of George leaving. So this is an this is purely a insert to move the drama forward. It's not an actual calendar. Right. So folks, just to recap, so the Beatles came in to the studio on January 2nd and this calendar is telling us that they have live shows scheduled for the 19th and the 20th. And of course, that's two and a half weeks. Yeah. And the other point we wanted to make here is that George, according to the official narrative, he walked out of the studio on January 10th and he was gone through the 15th because he had that argument with Billy on Monday, January 6th, and then 
Tensions continued to mount. George threw in the towel and said, I'm done with this. So he left at around lunchtime on the 10th, and he was gone through the 15th, and he returns on the 16th. So this makes this schedule even more impossible because yes. one of your guitar players is gone for a week. And you only have two and a half weeks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's, it's just craziness. And the other thing I wanted to point out, I should have mentioned this in my, my one video, Paul, and, and, uh, that January 19th, when it's the first day of the live shows, that's January, which is one and the 19th. So when you put the numbers together, you have 11, nine or nine, 11. So it's another nine, yep. 11 reference right there as to yep. when they're going to do the first day of the live shows. Yeah. Yeah. But in fact, another shot, shot we will discuss later. If Billy is uh, beneath the, uh, the clapperboard, the date on that clapperboard and the date of the live show also have very, <laughs> very uh, large meanings. Yeah. And the other thing I want to point out, folks, the Beatles did the rooftop concert on January 30th. So when we take January, which is one plus the, the 30th, one plus three is four plus 1969. It reduces down to the number 11. We see some um, dates will uh, will be crossed out to increase the tension and the drama. OK, now it's, uh, if you freeze here, OK. They are having lunch at the piano. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's well, it's it's strange for many reasons. Normally, uh, maybe you do it as well, Mike. I did it also. Uh, if you have a, a certain place where you work, usually you have another place where you have your lunch. Sort of get off, gonna have a little distance from your workplace. So you make a little walk or you go to a kitchen room or a dining room or a lunch room, whatever. But here they are seated, they are st staying seated in the recording room, having lunch there, right on top of the piano. So that's already maybe not l like you would expect. But then we have all the stuff on top of the piano, drinks, coffee, um, cigarette cases, um, napkins, all kinds of stuff. It, it, it seems strange to me. It looks like that they're in a garage. That's what <laughs> it looks like to me. It does not look like a professional recording environment. Now, of course, Someone's going to say, well, that's what it looked like. And I agree, that's what it looked like. But I'm it is it is very surprising it doesn't, to see it this doesn't, recording environment when you're talking about the greatest band of all time. Yeah, I mean it, later on we see when the discussion with George uh, happens. There's a shot where John where George arrives when in, in his Mercedes uh, six hundred, a very expensive car, one of the top line cars next to maybe uh, Bentley or Rolls Royce. The guys had money. So the studio had money um, and then they are having lunch inside the recording room it doesn't seem fitting to the status of the band. Yeah. Okay. In the background, now we see again, this Leslie speaker and we see a microphone standing on top of the amplifier, a guitar amplifier. Uh, this in re recording uh, technically, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have your microphone on top of, a, of an amplifier. So you get vibrations or, or even worse, you get uh, circuit interference, whatever. And, and another thing is that the, what I uh, researched was that if you make a recording of a Leslie um, speaker, you at least have two microphones to get that typical Leslie speaker sound. So this setup of recording microphones uh, at the Leslie speaker doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And again, all of these microphones, I mean, take a yeah. look at this picture, folks. We got a mic here, we got a mic here, we got a mic there, there's one here, there's one Ringo here. This is to catch the uh, the snare. He's They got a mic up here. There's a mic going down here. We have more microphones over here. Here's one here. Again, this, I guess, to get the toms. Yeah. Uh, Right. I mean, it's just microphones all over the place. And again, if, if you're rehearsing, no problem, no problem. But for recording, you, you couldn't record this way. You could not get a good recording. Exactly. With this type of microphone setup. 
Okay, do you want me to go forward, Paul? Yeah, let's please uh, forward. Okay. Uh, and we got John. Okay, we got John goofing. And in the background, we see the door, which we uh, talked about earlier. The right. emergency exit. The door where George was a little out of focus, but the door was in focus. Exactly. And now right we here. see in, the in this shot, we see George, uh, sorry, John uh, clowning about. And what I notice is that the, the the lighting on his face is very, yeah, it seems overworked uh, with the with the um, with the the, the restoring um, what they did. It's, it it doesn't seem real. I, of course, the short can can be real, but it it it, it calls questions uh, in my taste. Well, also it goes back to what I was saying before. You know, he, he was supposed to be a heroin addict, and here we are. And you know he's yeah. you know he's very active and in, in fact the exactly. trailer before this he he pulls his pants over his kneecaps and he's hopping up and down on the ground. I mean we don't see it in this recent trailer, but in the one before this we do. So yeah. I don't know, you know. Yeah, it doesn't seem okay. Lift that shot. Ah, okay. Now it's getting interesting. We see the um, the shot of uh, Billy standing next to the uh, the ten number yep the number of completion and new beginnings and he has a big complete. old smile on his face <laughs> yes um just for reference in the background we see ringo's drum kit without the uh, the sound baffling right so that's strange because i think this is again in the apple studio so why is he in one shot he is at the he uses these uh, sound barriers and in the next shot here he doesn't it doesn't make any sense whatsoever anyway right. we have John and Yoko down here. Yeah, but the, the meaning of this shot is kind of what you are exp expert in. The yeah, well, of the meaning of this shot is, first of all, he's dressed in black and white, duality, the number duality. 10, number of completion, new yeah. beginnings. This That's pose, what I think this represents. His pose is very uh, authoritative. Yes. Um, he has a smug smile on his face. Uh, he knows exactly what's been uh, shown here. And in the next shot, we get the uh, the other one. It's even this one. This is great. This this is um, uh, interesting for many reasons. Um, first of all, we have the um, the number eighteen. That's a, that's your territory, Mike. Maybe you can uh, explain a little bit on that. Well, it's the number nine. So one plus eight equals nine. And when when Billy plays the role of Paul McCartney, he's all about the nines. When he's himself as William or Billy he associates himself with the number six. So he, we could see him pointing up. Exactly. Number nine. Yep. Now he himself is very much in the, um, let's say the, the an image that is very well known as iconography uh, for the Jesus uh, figure, what we all know. The, he, and, 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 and a few tens of seconds before this, he is looking up to the, to the sign and he's, almost exactly in this typical iconography, iconography type of image of the Jesus figure. That's, you could say, well, it's it just, uh, it happened like that. That's true, but then we go to the next meaning on the clapperboard. Um, we, we see here on the clapperboard, the text Beatles show. Let um, me go back, Paul, you're talking about yeah, this one go here? Back, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, okay. we see here, uh, it says Apple Film Limited Beatles show, and I thought I thought would a camera crew, a filming and, and, and documentary crew, would they use the term show on the clapperboard? Wouldn't they just say um, Beatles recording, Beatles sessions, get back sessions, uh, whatever, or, or just the Beatles, or just Beatles? But Beatles show impl implies something which with a very different meaning okay so you want me to move forward paul yes please okay forward, yeah. um okay here we have billy's got his yellow shirt on you want me to move past this yeah this is, yeah, this is a little montage uh, i'm not sure what um mm, mm, okay and this is this is yeah this is the the scene where Billy off camera is saying uh, it's going to be such a comical thing like in 50 years time. Um, 
and then we see Yoko and um, and John uh, dancing. But Billy's uh, Billy's line of it's going to be such a comical thing, like in 50 years time, and <laughs> it sort of makes a reference to the the timeline we are now in. We are now 50 years later. Right. Right. So Billy seeing that in 1969 is also I don't know maybe it doesn't mean anything but it's it's uh, I noticed this yeah maybe a little predictive who knows right yeah yeah exactly. who knows but then we've got uh, still this is still a montage of the um, we got the calendar of, again of the calendar so and now uh, things um, how, how did they say it the plot thickens. Yeah, they said they have a meeting with George. And as I mentioned, the, the narrative in Wikipedia says George was out of there between the 10th and the 15th. They did meet with him. And when they met with him, he decided to come back on the 16th. So, yeah. But of course, but, with George being out of the studio for a week, as I mentioned before, Paul, um, that makes this whole 19th and 20th, uh, those dates, impossible. Totally impossible. But another interesting thing is, um, in, the, in the imagery we see, while we know now, now we know that he's, there is a meeting with George. So George is uh, having, a, having an argument. Uh, he's threatening to leave. And in fact, he, he does leave. And we know that this is taking place um, over five days time. And in the imagery, we see still, if you play it now, we still see the guys playing here, discussing, playing, but this is still the Twickenham studio. So what they are implying here is that the, the, the argument with George is still, the band is still in the Twickenham studios. So when George returns, is that still in the Twickenham studios or not? We are not sure. We don't get any information on that. We can only conclude it from the imagery, imagery over here. So when he returns, um, if it is still in the Twickenham studios and later on we know they move to the Apple studios, um, moving the whole entire crew, the instruments, the amplifiers, all the gear, including the grand piano, the Bludner, what we talked about earlier. Although the Apple building is only 10 miles away from the, uh, the Twickenham studios, this probably would take, let's say, a day at least. Moving a complete studio um, uh, environment from one studio to the next, Building up everything, plugging in all the cords, all the signals into the desk, uh, signal checking, sound checking, moving the grand piano. How much time does that stay, does that take? Um, well, if you move it, you're going to have to tune it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they move it downstairs in the basement of the Apple building. So the entire operation of moving all that equipment would it take a day, maybe two? That's another two days off the calendar. Well, an argument could be made that they had equipment in both studios so that they may not have had to move equipment. They just, just unplugged and then, you know, they went, when they went to Apple, all that equipment was there. Th that argument can be made. Can be made indeed. But if not, and we see in imagery, the Blutner piano, clearly visible, the Blutner sign on the, on the side of the piano. Did they have a Blutner piano in Apple as well as in Twickenham Studio? Hmm, not sure about that. It's a, it's like I say, it's a, it's an, it's a grand piano and a, a very expensive instrument. So if that, if they had to move it, okay, that would at least take a day. If not, then your argument stands. Then they had already, they only have to, um, had to move their, their, their guitars and the drum kit of uh, Ringo and at least that could have been done, let's say, between coffee and lunch. I'm not sure, right. but that could have been done, yes. Okay. So we have Billy reading this newspaper. Yeah, they are goofing about uh, in this, uh, this scene. This is a little montage of them. Um, um, this, this leads up to the crisis in the band. Because we know George is leaving. Uh, Paul is stressed out, John is stressed out, and now George quits. That's interesting. He says he George has... quits, right? And and here's the thing, Paul. Where's the date? Yeah, there's no date. All the other 
all the other uh, days of the calendar have a date. And here, <laughs> here we don't have a date, but we have in printed font, George quit. So again, here this manipulating imagery that doesn't make any sense in, in uh, All right, so just for the that. record, I mean, they're not showing it here, which is very, very interesting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, folks, George had the argument with Billy on Monday, January 6th. Tensions mounted. It didn't get any better. And then around lunchtime, this is the official story now. This is not Mike and Paul making up a story. George walked out on January 10th. He was out from the 10th through the 15th, and he returned on the 16th. So this image here, this shot where George quits with no date, this is very, very odd. It doesn't fit the rest of the shots of the calendar. No, because the so, rest of the calendar was very detailed. Here are the dates. We're Xing them off, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. So th th this this shot is already fabricated. We we can clearly conclude that. So okay, let me. It 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 um it leads up to the uh, here the shot John. I oh, sorry, George in his uh, Mercedes uh, six hundred. Well, and the Very other thing, expensive. Paul, I mentioned when we, we spoke last week is this this shot is not unseen. I've seen this so many times. It's a stock uh, stock footage of Alf, him uh, arriving at the, at the studio. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is yeah. something that's been played many times. Yeah. What appears here is that the discussion uh, not... leading up to the live shows is building up stress. So the discussion, the live shows, the stress, George leaving, George returning. It's all building up stress. To build the anticipation. Can they do this? Can they pull it off? Yeah. Right. Can they pull it off in, in time? Right, exactly. right. Okay. And there's the live shows again. Canceled. Uh, no, they're canceled. In the, in the same, they, it doesn't even appear to be uh, white out. It's just in another shot of the letters cancel, of the word canceled. It's not even on top of live shows. It's 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 edited. It's not real. It's uh, yeah. it's only to fu it function is only to increase drama. It's not a, um, increasing reality of the of a calendar being um, rewritten. Right. So it's dramatic effect. It's only dramatic. Okay. Now we have uh, John and John and Yoko dancing. I thought it was just a cute a cute scene. Well, everything is. I've seen that footage before too maybe they're going to say well it wasn't that exact footage but well it appears to be uh, this is in the twickenham studio and what you see in the background are these lamps uh stage um uh, stuff uh, on, the, on the left we see bongos and um, other stuff belonging to the studio so it, it appears to be and what i said earlier the the lamps the lights here are at a low angle and that creates these uh, harsh um uh, lit faces of the of the guys. Yeah, but it's, uh, like I say, it's nice to see the uh, Yoko and and uh, John uh, having some fun. Having some fun making out again. And remember, he's a heroin addict. So, <laughs> 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 all right. So but, here, yeah. here's a scene, a little tender moment. Yeah, and what we um, around this point. Um, mm. Yes, around this point, the as we know that the tension has risen, George has left, uh, what will happen next? Uh, the music of uh, Let It Be starts. And that's a very the, the soothing sound of the first chords of uh, Let It Be plays over this drama. So that's very clever editing to use that uh, song over this uh, scene. Yeah, and they look very worn out here. So this is Michael Lindsay Hogg here, I'm yeah, assuming, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I think so too. And again, yeah. he's talking directly to Billy, right? Yeah, Billy is the the man to talk to. No, John's not even in, in not, not even in the shot. No, and to the right is his wife. There's Linda, and then we have Ringo yeah. and George Ringo. looking, you know, rather bored. Yeah, uh, another thing of worth mentioning, maybe I'm not sure. Uh, we know that from all these sessions, there are are a lot of photographs uh, taken by Linda. But in this promo, we see Linda in this shot and in, um, later on in the, inside the desk uh, room, we don't see her using or wearing her camera. 
So that's just a little observation I made. But... Okay. All right. So you have a little one-eyed symbolism there. <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed this. I thought, well, it's probably not uh, intentionally. Um, and maybe it is, but it, at least it looks very unforced, un, uh, unprepared. Yeah, I don't that. know whether it's intentional or not, but... No. Yeah. Oh, there's more one-eyed symbolism. We got Yoko <laughs> peeking out from behind her hair. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's a nice shot. I think it's a nice uh, composition Between shot. the two of them, they have two eyes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's Billy. Now we get to the point where um, John is sort of starting to get tired under Billy's direction. We, we play it forward. Billy is stressed out. This is an insert from the from the rooftop, and it it's um, mixed together with these shots of the earlier years. Yeah. And now we got they they sort of um, they lean on the sentiment from where they have come. These boys, what they all uh, accomplished over all these years, all these famous concerts, and now they are still fighting to get this album uh, being made. So it's all to enhance the, the drama. Right, and this is Budokan. I recognize the background here in Japan, yeah. 1966. Now we have this discussion. Um, Michael Lindsay Hawk asks, um, in reference to, jo to George leaving, well, uh, documentary seems to grind to a halt. And then we see here John saying, grinding to a halt? It's getting just getting started, yeah. and then uh, Billy answers uh, something to that effect as well. Yeah, Billy was joking around. We're just getting started. It's just getting started, yeah. But it is. This is still, mind you, this is still in the Twickenham studio. So this is in the, indeed a, a little reference to the to the date it it took place. If George act, actually left uh, for six days, then this this shot was still in the Twickenham studios. But anyway. For for that time point. Uh, so this November. Okay, we see here Billy playing. Uh, okay, here this one freeze. Um, you you could read from John and um, and George. That they are under the the pressure of of Billy, Billy as as the band leader, uh, telling him what to do. Later on, we see uh, uh, Billy hovering over over John at uh, at the um, at the piano. But the, the pose here of Billy is interesting because also here again he sort of takes the sort of the, the Jesus pose with the arms spread. Maybe I'm I'm stressing uh, stretching uh, for an image, but it, it it this is how it appears to be. I think you're absolutely right. It's the savior pose and. It's the Savior pose, the Jesus Christ Savior pose. Yeah, and we have, and look at the way and we have George, you know. It's exactly composed. It's it's his arms and the, the boy's two faces are exactly yeah uh, symmetrical. It's it's a, a composed shot. This this you couldn't have caught with a with a with a random camera. Just oh look over there. No, you're too late. It's already gone. So this is a composed shot. It's also the and, same uh, type of shot, Paul. Uh, that is depicted on the back of the Sgt. Pepper album, where Billy has his back. Exactly. And the other Beatles, we see their faces, but on the back of Pepper, Billy has his back turned to us. So to me, yeah. this is a very, very similar type of um, depiction. Yeah. Yeah. It's a so, sort of an Im image, um, how do you say it? And uh, it makes a visual reference to something the audience already know. Yeah. And so you have a um, um, very strong um, reference uh, there. Well, he's in charge. And he's in charge, very much so. And in the next shot, we see him hovering over John at the... Um, here. You see John at the... Um, at the, the uh, synthesizer piano. Yeah, what is it? The keyboard, yeah. Yeah, the keyboard, yeah. yes, exactly. But we see... Uh, the. Again, here the, the the posture of of Billy, 
pointing out to John, no, no, you, the, the other chord, the other chord. No, it's not a B flat, it's an E minor, uh, whatever. How he's telling John what to play is very uh, stressing the, the power role he's, uh, yeah, he, he plays, he has. Well, again, it's, a, it's another piece of footage where it's showing us that Billy is the leader. Yes. He's directing. Yes. Right? And here we go again. He's, you know, he's pointing and he's directing. Pointing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you see John, John is very much, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's getting tired of this whole scenario. He's, uh, he's, he had enough of it. Right. His face expression is uh, very telling. Now we get up to the scene where the, the guys play together and we, um, where are we at 217? Yes, there's a small discussion going on. And, um, and then they flash back to this. And then they play, yeah. And, but during this flashback, we hear the soundtrack say, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. So again, very powerful lyrics over a very stressing moment um emphasizes the whole drama and uh, the soundtrack even more emphasizes this and then we go to the this scene yeah what i want what, yeah well a little little uh, thing I, a little observation i made is the piano is without its top lid uh, but there's no microphone in there so this is clearly billy playing uh, without any recording it's just something. I yeah, and, and this would be the microphone for the uh, film crew, right? For the cameras. For the, for the, for cameras. the film cameras, exactly. Okay. This is not. This is not your actual um, recording uh, microphone. Okay. Again, here, Im old imagery. Now you, John and uh, George. Uh, Playing. Yeah, trying to tie it back. Old yeah. period, new period. Yes, exactly. And this leads up to the scene where the four guys together are playing and we get a comment from the booth, from the desk. This is all montage. Yes, this shot. John's leaning over his shoulder. The, the recording engineer, Glenn Johns, is asking on the soundtrack, John, once more then, and then we get to uh, the shot from the, the sound uh, desk. So he asks once more then, and then we hear, we hear John answer, but we see a completely different image. If you play it. This, this shot. Yeah. And, and the shot, we, we see John answering um, Glenn Johns. So John answers, um, I mean, we'll never get a chance to do it again. And then we see on the word again, we see this uh, this cut to another scene. We see clearly here. Well, he's got that blue Billy. and yellow shirt on again. Yes, John's blue and yellow. Billy is wearing orange at his guitar and George is wearing red. And then we cut to the, uh, the next scene. Th this scene is uh, indeed is uh, continuous. And then the next scene. We hear, yeah. yeah, that's not. Billy is, made, is wearing blue, John is wearing white, Yoko is in the picture, and everybody is doing something completely different. So this goes back to what you were saying before, Paul, that it's not contiguous, and it's it was done to to kind of copy and paste and put it together so yeah. that it would create, uh, well, it would create the trailer and a story and something people would be interested in. But uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, it doesn't, at, at least it is not uh, uh, continuous uh, editing from scenes from, a, or shots from the same scene. It's from different scenes, from different sessions, different days. Uh, I, I assume that the guys wear, wear different clothes every day. So um, this is clearly from another, she, another scene. Yeah. If not, if not um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't go as to, to say, um, as far as to say that this is, uh, 
uh, fabricated, but it's it's from a different uh, different right. session. Right. Well, I, I yeah. hope they change your clothes every day. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. Is Billy directing again? Right. Billy directing again with his right hand. <laughs> I wouldn't know if a, if a director always uses his strong or his weak hand, but I would assume it's your strong hand. Yeah, they are now having fun, grooving a little bit. Oh, this shot is this is the guys sitting at the at the desk, and uh, what I noticed is that in all shots of the de the guys hanging at the desk and playing. Uh, um, uh, um, grooving to the playback or uh, whatever, smoking, uh, whatever. The sound engineer is not at the desk. So if they would listen to to playback, the sound engineer would 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 be at his desk. Would would uh, control the, the 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 playback. Yeah, he he would be They'd at the board. In. You at the board exactly. He would mix in a little bit more drums, a little less uh, guitar, whatever. Now the other thing that's a problem with this scene. Paul, and I'm not saying it was, you know, created this way. I'm just saying maybe it, it, this is exactly how it looked. We see the coffee cup right here. Exactly. Okay. Now, if you're a sound engineer and you're running this control room, you would never yeah. have a coffee cup or any kind of cup that could possibly have liquid in it sitting on your board. Because if that exactly. tips over, you're going to have you're a done. big problem. Yes. An electrical and also, problem. Not in this shot, but in some other shots, we see that the guys are the, the ashtrays are on top of the of the board. So the guys are smoking and drinking uh, above or on top of the board. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. This is all montage. Okay, this is this is, this is my favorite shot. scene here. Yeah, <laughs> this is a shot you you already called out. Uh, the entering of Billy in the in the recording room. It it could be that it has taken place like like here uh, shown, but it very much looks like it's not. It's composed of Billy, uh, maybe in another room entering whatever, but it's shown here. I I guess they show they only filmed a Mal leaving the studio. Yes, Mal here. And, yeah, and uh, the shot of Billy very much seems uh, put in afterwards on a different image layer. Edited in the um, post. It's how it looks to me. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the outline of Billy Preston, yeah. and it yeah. just looks like it's layered or superimposed yeah. onto this yeah. background. Exactly. That's how it looks to me. And later on, when we see um, Billy playing guitar, shot together with uh, the famous, uh, <laughs> we go to, we come to that uh, in a bit. Uh, he, we see him playing then with uh, with Billy together. It also seems fake. This is still a montage. Okay, so I guess we're getting yeah. to the rooftop scene here now. Now, leading up to the rooftop scenes, but it is intercut with some scenes from the studio uh, as well. So we see here the guys playing. Okay, this stop, please. We see here George playing his uh, Fender Telecaster. Very clearly, a Telecaster with a brown body and a white uh, picking plate and a light brown strap. This is typically George's guitar. Then, if we move forward, oh, there are the meters the again. We talked about this. Where this is an insert, yeah. possibly. This is possibly an insert. We know that the board has VU meter, uh, four VU meters. Okay, we see it. We, we see them actually over here in the next shot on the board. These meters are side to side on top of the board. Here, these little, little, this, this gray. Um, there's maybe another shot where you can see it from the from the guy's point of view. But anyway. Now, we, in a moment, we get uh, this is some street shots. This one, okay. I thought, like the shot earlier from Billy Preston, 
that this is um, put in afterwards on a different image layer. Here again, like you already pointed out, Mike, the contour of his body, his head, his hair, it seems strange. It doesn't seem to fit inside the scene. Yeah. What I notice, what I notice is that the um, the lighting, it could be, but it's it's sort of seems off. I'm not sure how to call it. But um, the more important thing is what you said, Mike. Billy is playing George's guitar, and what we see is that he he's he's playing uh, he's having the guitar on the same strap as George. So the strap is way too short for him to play his his guitar as a as a lefty. There's a bigger problem. This is a right-handed guitar, right? So this is what George was playing earlier. So yes. for for Billy to be playing this guitar, he would have had to reverse the string order. Yes. Right. So when George plays right-handed, the low E string is right here, and the high E, the first string, is down here. So how so this... Billy could be playing standard chords yeah. and this looks to me to be he's probably playing like a it looks to me like he's playing a b flat type of chord here and the problem that we have folks is that in order for billy to play this properly the guitar would have had to have been restrung and to reverse the order of the string. So remember, when George is playing it, because it's a right-handed guitar, here is the low E, the bass string, and here is the high E, which is the treble side of the, the strings across the fretboard. And not only would they have to reverse the string order, but the nut, which has slots in it, would have to be Reslotted because you cannot yep. get a low E bass string in, in a exactly. high E slot. Yeah. Okay, so this whole thing is just off. So this it makes no sense. It makes no sense. This is if this happened, if this happened, it's completely staged, and yeah. he can't possibly. When I say he, Billy can can't possibly be playing anything. That makes any sense. The strings are in reverse order. So this is a very, very peculiar shot. And whoever put this together didn't understand this. That's how I look at this, Paul. They didn't realize that when they did this, that somebody who plays guitar would pick up on this right away. But for him to have the, the, the guitar uh, restrung, it takes at least a couple of minutes, whatever. If you have a professional uh, guitar uh, guy, Mal Evans would probably do that in a, in, a, in a bit. But still, why would you restring a guitar when there's maybe laying around five, six other guitars? So from that standpoint, this is totally nonsense. It's nonsense. It is nonsense. In, in whatever way, and even if they, did, re you, even if they uh, did restring the guitar, Paul, they would have to do something with the nut. They would have to yeah. pop the old nut out, put a yeah. uh, a lefty nut in, or somebody yeah. would have to, you know, take their filing tools. Because I do this, folks. I mean, I do guitar repair, so I, I know what I'm talking about here. You know, something would have to be done with the nut. So, like you said, this whole thing does not make any sense. Here we have the, this is the low E string right here. We could see that this, this string is larger. It's thicker, okay, right here. We don't see it up here. That's no. because that's the lighter string. That's the high E. So this guitar, based upon what I'm looking at right here, Paul, was there. This is yes. a better view right here. That's a good view. Yeah. You could see here's the E, here's the A, here's the D. Yeah. These are the bass strings. The guitar was not restrung. Restrung. It was not. No, it's visibly. Visibly a lefty, a, a righty guitar for a right hand handed person. Yeah. Classically, classically um, uh, strung as we know it for a normal, or normal, but for a right handed uh, player. Right. Yeah. All right, so I'll move forward again. Sorry about that.
like I said, the shots here in the streets are for, uh, what I think uh, un untouched in terms of um, artificial uh, image enhancement. Yeah, they look like this. All the scenes yeah, we've they seen look, before. Yeah, relatively normal. Still goofing around. This shot, I thought, well, maybe I'm not sure. Um, Ringo, he, he mimes the movement of a, of a film camera, but in fact, he's telling us, "Look, look, guys." <laughs> we are bil being filmed. It's a show. It's all performance. It's all an act. Yeah, the Beatles show. The Beatles show. It's like show. they had on the clapperboard. Exactly. Yeah. Like the clapperboard set. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's his meaning at that time of this shot, but I said things um, are now before us. They, they could have easily been interpreted like this. Okay. This is all montage. The guys having fun. Like John's position Look. here. <laughs> yeah. It's very strange. And by the way, uh, Yoko is probably looking at some um, coupons or the latest uh, dinner reservation. Uh, I'm not sure what she's yeah, maybe doing. Maybe she's, she's reading some. coupons to go shopping or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's just a little, little joke. Experience the three-part event. Experience it. Yeah. It, it's an event. It's how it's presented as an event, as an, as a, as a how do you say it? A sideshow, as a, as a, a carnival. Uh, this this one here, you and I both picked up on Linda's face. Looks like, yeah, it's very much enhanced, enhanced. in terms of the uh, the digitally enhancement of of these faces and this uh, contrast uh, regain. Let me go back and we'll I'll start that again. Let me see here. Okay, there you go. So we see Linda here, and what I think is it's very. Um, enhanced in terms of the image, um, the contrast uh, gain and the uh, image enhancement. It looks very much off. Even for an untrained eye, you could see, well, why is Linda's face so strangely um, clear uh, lit? Yeah. I noticed it right and away, again, Paul, when I first watched it without yeah. you saying anything. I said, boy, she looks like her face has been enhanced. And another thing is what I talked about earlier. We know that she um, took a lot of photographs during these uh, sessions, uh, but never in the, at least in the promo did we see her wearing or using a camera. Now, you could argue, okay, she only took some photos one day during the whole session. That could well be. Another thing is, if that's the case, you would probably miss out on interesting moments. Normally, when you are photo photographing uh, an event, you will have your camera all the time with you. Only if you go to lunch, then you maybe take it off for a, a few moments. But all, every other moment, you have your camera with you. We'll have to see what and he does. We'll have to see what he does with the documentary. Uh, how much he yeah, shows I, of Linda and whether she has the camera. It's tough to do with like a three and a half yeah. minute, you know. Exactly right. Exactly. We we cannot make a judgment based on but this. But your point is is well and, made. I mean, we should see her with a camera. I would think. Yeah. I think. Okay. Let's. Because the other the other photo the other photographer the uh, Ethan A Russell the he is in some some shots not visibly but he is he is there, and from him also are um, very uh, many photos uh, known that that he took during the session. So every time we see him in. Uh, in a frame, he's wearing a camera, or better yet, he's pointing the camera um, to the guys. He's having the camera to his face, to to his eye. So that's in contrast to Linda, who's who's never wearing a, her camera. Yeah. Here. This is all a montage. Ringo is lining up the frame. Yeah, this scene here, interesting that George and John uh, hug each other while uh, leaving the studio. It's just, I thought, well, 
interesting that the camera picks up on this, that they filmed the guys leaving the studio. It almost seems contrived to me. Exactly. You know? But like I said, it, it's, we cannot make judgment more than what we do now here, based right. on, the, on the, the footage. Well, now we're getting up to the, um, yeah, this is sort of the, the end of the studio footage. Now we get the last shots, which go to take us takes us to the uh, to the rooftop. And there we have it, folks. Set back. <laughs> <laughs> or others had said, "Hey, the you know the shepherd's crook." Yeah, the shepherd's right? crook. So yeah. many many comments on online already were made on this at the uh, Stephen Weber. Um, um, Sorry, I mispronounced his name. Oh, Steve Fauber? Um, I see Steve Fauber. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a lot of astute subscribers. It's amazing what people pick up on. Yeah. It's great. Now we get to the rooftop scenes. And one one thing that I noticed what's interesting is the um, rooftop fairly clearly shows that it's been boarded with very... Um, well, I think it's something like a 1,000 square uh, foot of, uh, of wooden uh, planks. Planks right here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And um, there are still photos from the location scouting made by um, the, the Ethan A. Russell uh, photographer who made these shots, where we can see the guys scouting the rooftop for the location to, uh, to, to have the concert. And what you can clearly see that those shots show the roof of the section where it is not being planked. And here it is very clear that it's all new wood placed precisely for the uh, for the, uh, the concert. And this um, set me to the thought of um, the timing and the planning of this, this rooftop. If you have 1000 square feet on of wood, that you want to have uh, installed on top of your uh, your standard uh, roof felt, you have to get it over there. First, you have to think about the idea. We're going to um, do the show on the top of the building. So you have your image, uh, sorry, your ID forming, you have your concept, then you have to start planning. You have to buy the wood, you have to bring it over there. You have to transport it on top of the, on the building, so you have to have a crane. You cannot uh, probably are planks of at least three feet long. You cannot transport them through the the stairwells up upstairs. So you have to bring it in from from the street level with a crane. So you have to use a crane. You have to rent a crane, a crew, um, um, a crew of carpenters to fit it all on the roof. Um, then you have to plan the day of the concert with all your instruments moving on top. So from the basement of the building on top of the uh, on the roof, um, you have to organize all your your camera crew. They have separate lightings. You see uh, here in this shot that they have these floodlights. They used to um, because it's a, a gray day with cl a cloudy overcast day, so the lighting is not optimal. They use extra lights to uh, give the camera crew an um, sufficient um, uh, lighting scheme to work uh, with. Um, security, the police is probably uh, in on it. All these things take very long, longer, I think, than just one person scouting, uh, shouting it from, from uh, let a guy, let's. I, I know. I have an idea. Let's play on the top of the of the building, and then uh, three minutes later, you you start playing. It, it doesn't work like that. No, it couldn't be spontaneous, because no, it, it, I would no. think, Paul, at the very least, they would have to have a building engineer come in to make sure yeah. that the roof can sustain uh, what you're bringing up there, the equipment, the people, and so on. There's a lot of weight because you don't want to get up there, yeah. start playing, and you fall through the roof, and you wind up, you know downstairs. So I, I agree with you that these planks here, and I don't know if we're going to see it in this footage, but you did have a still that you sent over and, and folks can go take a look at yeah. the rooftop scene, you know, by doing a search. And you can see that these planks do not go all the way across, that they are there uh, where they are oh. going to perform, where they're going to play. Exactly. Only the, let's say the, the bandstand area 
is planked. The other uh, um, um, area of the building, let's say behind the uh, the rail uh, uh, the railings uh, behind George, uh, sorry behind Ringo, that part of the building is not being planked, and the still images of uh, by uh, Ethan A. Russell clearly show that that is the the standard roof felt. Well, and, you can see um, it up here, right? Yeah, it, it's it looks like that exactly right, right up here. But like what what you said also is the the weight um, distribution over the over the the roof. A roof is not built for that the, these types of uh, of load forces. So you you have to disperse these this loads over the entire area of the roof, and there is where these planks uh, come into play. And it's very thought uh, well thought of. It's uh, probably like you said. It's maybe they 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 had an engineer who looked at it who could tell the type of planks they have to use to make sure that this plus also we have an, an, an um, a sort of a improv railing where the, the cameramen are standing uh, you don't want people uh, falling over um like i say we had the entire camera crew and what i read about is um, that they have six uh, six camera um six cameras filming this uh, this concert and this shot indeed from the other uh, side of the street was indeed a uh, an, an actual camera. We discussed it before, and we we doubt at least, at least I doubted it um, if the, if that was a real camera of that or, or if it was a, a still image that they reworked into a moving scene. But it's it's in the original um, documentary as well. So we have a camera across the street. This also um, asks for coordination. Um, uh, people um, stage hands with. Uh, Maybe with walkie-talkies, you have to plan this way, uh, way up uh, in, in advance. Okay, so the net of it is, and I agree with you that this wasn't spontaneous. They weren't downstairs, fifteen minutes prior, and said, "Hey, let's move all the stuff up to the rooftop and let's put on a little performance." Right? So, uh, and of course, there's nothing wrong with doing the the performance on the rooftop. I think it's great, but uh, the story that it was just this spontaneous decision and they went upstairs and they did it uh i i agree with you that no this had to be planned out because like i said you know if if you don't have the weight distributed correctly uh then you could wind up having a problem and, and another interesting thing is i'm not sure uh, at what moment in time it is um i have it at 340 if you can can you go back a few few moments in this uh, rooftop uh, scene John. I mean, take a look at how old these buildings are, Paul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. This one. You see the guy standing in front of John, sitting on his knees right. with the red hair. He's holding up a sheet of paper with a score. We're talking about this guy here. And he's yeah, definitely holding there. up a clipboard. He's holding up a clipboard with, with I think, with a score. Okay, because John John is singing, so he doesn't have to read the score. He knows it by heart. Well, maybe it's lyrics. Billy, maybe it's lyrics for Billy to read off of. Maybe you know. But like I say, it's it's only on this uh, on this song. It's not on all the other songs. It's only here that this guy is holding up uh, the music uh, sheet or the score or the lyrics, whatever. So this is like this is say, a shot from across the street, obviously. This is from from across the street, and this guy in the the, the brown trench coat. He is filming uh, this camera. So what we see here, the two cameramen are filming each other. Interesting. And we can see, here's the roof, the building next door, yeah. right? And we can that's, see here. That's normal. And I don't think this is planks here. This just looks, I no. don't see planks here, but this looks like this up no, here. Some, some roofs have concrete uh, tops, but usually uh, you have this typical roof felt and it's a um, it's a bit uh, how do you call it in english a bitumen based um, roof felt for making it um, watertight yeah. and if you normally work workmen who who, uh, who re repair or who made uh, this they are used to it they know how to walk where to put your feet not to damage this uh, roof felt if you damage it, you get a leakage, and then you can start all over, all over again. Yeah. But if you have if you have twenty people, or uh, I, I don't know, yeah, uh, at least twenty people standing on the roof, it it will get uh, damaged. You don't want to have that. So the, the the planking on the roof is very uh, useful. 
but it takes a, a planning that is not considered in the uh, earlier um, uh, calendar uh, story. Yeah, and like you said, Paul, they put a rail up here. Yeah, they put a rail up. And, yeah. uh, and it's highly unlikely that they took these planks and brought them up through the stairwells and oh. brought them up and then started laying them down. Uh, they possibly had to bring in a crane. Yeah, so I had to bring in a crane. So a crane rental uh, is all, it, it all asks for planning days in, in uh, advance. And um, so, well, like you say, it's not spontaneously yeah. um, done. It, it, and what, 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 I've, uh, what is not clear in these shots is that halfway or somewhere around the end of the, uh, the concert, <clears throat> these um, policemen enter the building. And um, there's an interesting footage in the, uh, um, if you watch the entire concert footage, you see Bobby's, the English Bobby's entering the building, but you see it filmed from both sides of the door at the same time. <laughs> so this clearly shows me that uh, police were were in on it. They were, they know, they knew they were being filmed, or even better, they um, were in on it and they uh, they acted out uh, the entire scene. Yeah, I I. I would have to agree with you that this was completely scripted, including the whole thing with the police. I know the scene you're talking about. Um, so, yeah. you know, like everything else, it's it's theater. It's theatrics. It's a show. It's a show yeah. You know? Because the, the whole premise of playing on the rooftop, for who are they playing? The guys in the streets barely uh, hear, uh, hear, heard anything. I mean, the the... the Amplifying of the sound. I don't know what speakers they use, but it's only monitor speakers. What I think it's it's what they up, had up there. But the problem yeah. is, is that th this this becomes like this is a big echo chamber. That okay. That that's true. Right. So this is a big that's echo chamber down here. So they're playing, and the sound is reverberating off the buildings, off the windows, and it just sounds like a big right. mess. Right. Right. It's like a, a bad concert hall with a, with a bad uh, acoustic. Yeah. Well, this was a very interesting discussion, Paul. It's amazing, too. It's been uh, two hours for us to go through a like a three and a half minute <laughs> clip. <laughs> so just taking a look through it. And again, folks, you know, we're just watching and making some observations and sharing some insights. And, uh, you know, some folks are going to agree and others may not agree but that's okay uh you know we're just chit-chatting and taking a look at possibilities but there are definite well, anomalies yeah. in that trailer yeah. paul that you know yeah. that you've called out that do call into question and as i have said i i do believe that peter jackson has been given the job by billy to buff up this period of the beetle history to make it less negative and yeah. you know to infuse it with a, a more positive tone a more positive yeah. storyline even if they uh, used existing images so let's say the discussion about uh, peter jackson uh, using uh, real cgi real uh, computer generated images from nothing i don't think that's the case at least for total images, maybe from for the, the details that we already discussed, uh, superimposed images, eyes that, uh, that moved across, uh, things like that. But if if they indeed used uh, the, the existing images, it still tells a story which is uh, made up from uh, edits uh, over a soundtrack and a narrative that's being emphasized by yeah, juxtaposition of certain uh, type of images, uh, inserts of the calendar, uh, the timeline. So the, the, the uh, let's say the induced drama. Um, it's it's um, a, a real clever piece of of editing and and image uh, uh, processing. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what this looks like, the final product. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, the part of me that says don't bother watching it because I don't want to feed the beast. But there is yeah. there is another part of me that says, I want to see exactly what he's done, you know, because what he does, I keep yeah. going back to, if this was such great footage, 
why was it not in the original film? You yeah. know, so I, I think that uh, I believe there's a lot of liberties that were taken. And I yeah. think the technology, and, and you, you might disagree with me, is probably more prevalent than we might think uh, in order to enhance the story. I, I do believe that. And uh, yeah, because you know, all the happy, smiling faces that he's showing us in these trailers, you know, it's a very sharp contrast to uh, what we all know the original film was about. I mean, I, I watched the original film a number of times. I have a copy of it on DVD. It's well documented that it was a very tense and um, down time for the Beatles as a band. So, you know, for him to pump up the tires and make it look like it was just one old big old jolly time, I don't know. And also what, the, um, the, um, what, what you said earlier about what we know how George... Uh, later um, looked back on on this yeah. uh, period of time and, and also what uh, even um, uh, recently uh, how uh, Ringo is sort of distancing himself from the uh, the film that um, that uh, that Michael Lindsay Hogg made and um, well from, from George you already mentioned we know how he uh, thought about this period in, uh, in time so these these um, um, these opinions of these of the, the guys, the guys from the band, how they looked back on this period of time, is completely different from what Peter Jackson is telling us. Right. And then then you have to ask yourself, okay, what what is true and what is manipulated and what is contrived and what is a, a clever edited and uh, what is indeed uh, CGI uh, things we I mean certain things we could see we picked up on uh, both, but certain things maybe we missed. Right. Uh, I mean, Peter Jackson is a clever guy, and he's very clever. Um, um, uh, and he has state-of-the-art the technology. He, the technology he has, I mean, he can the, the, the stuff he, he made for, for these uh, Lord of the Rings uh, films is amazing. So I, I, I believe that he can do anything he wants with imagery. And uh, what he shows us here is already very clever, and maybe we, we missed half of it. But um, at least we picked up on some uh, interesting points. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, for everybody who's watching this and is ultimately going to take a look at the documentary when it comes out later this month, watch it with a discerning eye. That's all I would say. And as you yes. watch it, keep in mind the original story, the original narrative. You know, keep that in mind as you're watching it. And, and then mentally note the contrast in presentation, whereas the Michael Lindsay Hogg version of Let It Be going back to 1970 when it was released, again, was showing a band that was hitting its demise. It was a band that had a lot of tension and that tension started way before Let It Be and it extended way beyond Let It Be. And you have to keep that in mind. So don't get just caught up in all of the the fantastical presentation that Peter is going to present, because I'm going to tell you, it's it's not going to be reality. I don't think so. Right. Anyway, Paul, this was excellent, and I'm I'm so glad that you uh, agreed to come on and talk about this. And uh, so I, I think that we shall see. Right later this month, we shall see how <laughs> close to the mark you and I are. <laughs> okay. I'm like I say, I'm. Uh interested in what's uh, how people will respond